This is the Open University. Hello, fake students. I'm your fake lecturer in this fake free-for-all, post-truth environment of um, uh, the Open University, entre guillemets. Um, where have I been for a month? I've been letting you down, all 985 of you who watched the last video from Paris, which was called Over-Touristification. But I've been a busy little squirrel um, getting ready for the autumn, which is, of course, the high culture season throughout Europe. Um, and I've been throughout Europe. I went to Barcelona, I went to Brussels, I went to Gerswalde, a little village just north of Berlin. That's, where, that's a good place to start. Um, I spent a weekend uh, in Gerswalde, which is where my friend Jan Lindberg lives, um, uh, whose who's girlfriend, a Korean girlfriend, is subletting this apartment in Berlin to me as they've gone off to live the country dream. Um, this seems to be the new urban frontier, uh, is, is the non-urban, the ex-urban, the post-urban, uh, is the countryside. And it's a beautiful biosphere, a nature park out there, which they have um, kind of taken, taken it upon themselves to transform into a sort of rather hip place. I went out there and this little house that Jan bought for a couple of thousand euros was transformed into a sort of fashion studio with this very trendy... Um, woman with a, an amazing hairstyle uh, selling her clothes, um, handmade clothes, and apparently she's just bought a house in the village. This village was started by someone called Lola Randall, who's um, a novelist and film producer and all sorts of other things, and she's made it into a sort of creative community. And um, the people like Vin Vendors have moved in nearby, I think he's in the next village. Um, I met um, <coughs> um, uh, members of Malaria and uh, Pali Schaumburg were there. Um, uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, sort of Neue Deutsche Welle, a certain generation of people, maybe slightly older people, who seemed very much connected to Berlin, the city of Berlin, maybe in the 80s, are now kind of out there in the countryside. And they're not doing the kind of Faust thing of living a hippie kind of commune ideal. It's a much more modern post-new wave, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, hype it up, hype, hype, hype. There's been lots of hype in the papers. It's very cosmopolitan as well. These Japanese women who actually live around here in my neighborhood in Neukölln are running a restaurant at weekends in the warm season anyway, the summer season out there at Gersfalde. So that's always a beautiful pastoral idyll, but I'm such a, such a sort of itchy, scratchy urban person that I'm always really relieved to get back after a couple of days in that countryside despite the plants and the insects and the trees uh, uh, being wonderful and a fantastic combination with this cosmopolitanism which is out there. Anyway, I was invited for a specific purpose this time, which was to talk in a kind of talk event they had called System Sturz, which is a system collapse, basically talking about the very prolonged collapse of capitalism and alternatives to capitalism. So that, that really, that is kind of what they're out there doing. They're the creative class who would have been once upon a time at the service of capitalism, trying to brainstorm ideas through. And there were people from, um, from um, catastrophe, climate catastrophe, extinction rebellion um, movement uh, and uh, philosophers and all sorts of people. So uh, we, were, we took turns to interview each other and then be interviewed by, it's like a sort of tag team thing where, where for 15 minutes you would be interviewed by someone and then you would in your turn interview the next guest. So a bit like a, a, an endless chat show or pecha kucha, this kind of idea. So that was refreshing, but I was also glad to get back to Berlin. But no sooner had I returned to Berlin than I um, had to go off by a slow travel to uh, Spain, where I was engaged to sing a concert at a festival in Barcelona, in a theatre called the Victoria Theatre. Um, in the meantime, I, I had, to, uh, had to approve the artwork for Accordion, which Hagen Verleger was working on. And um, he's very purist and minimalist uh, and typographically oriented. So we had a little bit of a struggle this time because I wanted to put an image, a kind of silly cartoony image of me. Here it is um, on the cover. And Hagen really was not happy with that. So I went with his instincts because, for instance, when he did Glyptotech a few years ago, I thought that was, at first, I thought it was way too minimal. But then I really got to like it. And I realized that just black on white kind of worked really well, it was very strong graphically and visually. So I'm sure he's right this time as well. <laughs> 
Um, it looks a little empty to me still as a, as a cover design, but um, I'm sure it'll grow on me. And um, it'll look nice and papery, and it, it won't date as quickly and, and look as kind of silly as my image idea. What else? Yeah, I w so I went off by slow travel to Barcelona, and... Um, my thing now is to take trains, even uh, supposedly you're supposed to, if your journey is more than four hours, you tend to fly. And that's fairly sensible. It's also much cheaper to fly, but there's just the stress of getting to the airport, wondering what the weather's going to be like. Is it going to be bumpy? Um, and being herded onto these little tight jets, you know, I really hate it. Um, so... I now have the luxury of being, I was being paid very generously for this festival, and I thought, well, why, why not just spend all that money on, you know, slow trains, local trains if possible. I, that's my preferred way is to, in France or in Germany, to take the local trains over the, uh, the high-speed trains, because although it does take an hour or two longer to get from, say, Stuttgart to Berlin, it's much cheaper. It's only 44 euros Stuttgart to Berlin if you take, like, six local trains. Also, you get to change every hour, stretch your legs, walk about, buy some food in a town, see a little bit of a town that you're changing in. Um, you might have 20 minutes. The trouble is that the, the German, the Deutsche Bahn, is actually very inefficient in terms of meeting its time schedules. And uh, you're often, if you have just 10 minutes to change trains, you're often going to miss your connecting train. So you might end up spending more, than, more time than you bargained for in each little town. But I had some amazing experiences, especially coming back through Germany from Stuttgart the other day. Um, it actually got very turbulent and I was almost train sick because just south of Erfurt, I didn't even realize these mountains were there, but it's actually quite hilly and the train was really screeching about round the corners, trying to make up for lost time because it was running a bit late. And I was in the bathroom trying to pee into the, the, the toilet there and just thinking, God, if, this, if I were on a plane and it was this turbulent, I would be terrified. But it, because it's a train, it's somehow more domestic and survivable. If there's some sort of crash, you know, it's much more survivable. It seems much more survivable. So um, I was kind of happy and I, I didn't actually get trains. I've never been train sick. It's never been so twisty and bumpy that you actually throw up. Um, I tend to be quite good in those, those motion sickness scenarios. So, um, yeah, I got to Barcelona the slow way. Uh, it took three days essentially to get down. It's what, 2,000 miles or something. So I went down through via, um, where did I go? Basel is usually the, uh, the place where you spend the night because it's, um, it's uh, right on the sort of border of France, Germany and Switzerland. Um, but you always have to, because of the roaming fees, which the EU has forbidden phone companies to use in, other, in EU countries, but as soon as you get into Switzerland, which is a third country, as Britain will shortly be, the, the phone charges go through the roof. And so even just once I had to just book a hotel in Milan while going through Switzerland and my phone bill was so astronomical that it might, I instantly ran out of credit and um, it was 25 euros or something for, you know, 10 minutes online. It was ridiculous. So Britain, this is what awaits you when the EU is no longer legislating against bendy bananas or roaming fees on your behalf. Um, so, yeah, I changed at Basel and... Um, found a really nice place to have lunch in Basel, which is this domed, huge domed food court, um, the Markthalle, near the station. And then continued rattling, trundling down. I think I, I changed, in, I stayed in the south of France somewhere. Um, actually, from Montpellier to, um, to Barcelona is a very short run. Barcelona is really up in the north of Spain, and you can get there very easily from the south of France. So I, I then had like a week in Barcelona, and I was staying in this hostel called Unite, which is a very industrial chic kind of hostel. I booked a, they didn't have any single room, so I booked a whole dorm to myself. So I had like eight beds potentially to sleep in. But um, it was very close to the beach. Uh, and Barcelona is kind of, it's an amazing city. It's kind of like Paris, but on the sea. Uh, so it has, whereas Paris has fake beaches, uh, the Paris Plage thing along the Seine. Barcelona has real beaches with real sea. And there was amazing kind of strong, humid, warm wind. It was about 30 degrees and strong winds coming in from the sea and I was just walking along the breakwater um, at dusk and looking at the sea and thinking what an amazing city. Barceloneta, beautiful um, kind of rather unspoiled despite the touristification and over touristification um, <clears throat> which of course just makes Barcelona vibrant and cosmopolitan. Um, it, uh, it has unspoiled areas of course. So um, I spent a lot of time on the beach and um, 
there's, a, there's people naked on the beach and topless on the beach, but it really makes you realize that people are much sexier with their clothes on. I always keep my clothes on. I'm not really a beach kind of person. Um, but it was nice to, to wander around. And um, the concert, <coughs> it's funny, it kind of reminded me a little bit of why I hated touring as a support act in the old days when I was on Creation and all the rest of it. Because you... I mean, I, I was asked to turn up at 12.30. Not, not the organisers' fault. Well, I, I, the organisers seemed very distressed. One of them was actually in tears when I was introduced to her. I don't know what had gone wrong, but something logistically was, was nightmarish in that festival. So I was asked to turn up at 12.30 to sound check, and I was still waiting at 2.30 for this band. I think they were called Patience, a British band, ironically called Patience, because they were imposing patience on me were using their sound check as a rehearsal, and that is one of my pet hates. Bands who don't rehearse until they get to the sound check and then make the other bands wait for hours while they, you know, they bring their own sound man with them who's sort of super indulgent to them and tries to keep all the other artists away. So I, I was getting very passive aggressive. I, I was fine sitting in my dressing room for one hour or something, but by the second hour, I'd been on time, I'd been efficient, I'd been out every, doing everything I'd been asked to do, but then I just sort of drifted up to the side of the stage and just stood there with my arms folded, looking super passive-aggressive. And of course the band, the singer, Patience, came out to, to say hello and try and be nice to me. But they were, they were just in this mode of kind of saying, oh, let's just try that number one more time. And it wasn't anything to do with the sound or the lines that you were supposed to check. My sound checks are always like 10 minutes, you know. I check that the video output works and I check that the audio output works and I sing, the mic's going to work. You know, there's three things to do and it's generally not that hard, although I did have lots of problems with digital connector versus analog video connector and stuff. I had to run to the Apple Store and back before my performance. But uh, anyway, at least there is an Apple Store in Barcelona and it was open. So it, the, the performance went well. Um, here are some clips from it. And here's a picture of me jumping on the street nearby. Um, what did I do in Barcelona also? I don't know. I, I, I then headed up to, to France again and to Lyon, where the Lyon Biennale was uh, just opening. And um, that was a big letdown, I have to say. Uh, I... Um, I was I was there a, a few years ago with Gilles and Flo, and it was actually really exciting. A sort of very fresh biennial, but um, I, I think the Palais de Tokyo people from Paris were the curators this time, and they'd taken these huge warehouses, four enormous electronics warehouses, or ex-electronics warehouses, where they used to build televisions or something, in the southern part of Lyon. Lyon's a very vibrant city with a big student population and um, some very radical left-wing bookshops, and I really liked Lyon. But um, it, uh, the biennial was, was so dull that I ended up taking a lot of photographs of the floor of the factory with the sort of handwritten lettering saying, you know, boxes here and stuff, rather than the art on display. It was kind of a, a sort of a vague installation art which had no resonance to me polit personally and politically in any, in any way, uh, aesthetically. Um, and, you know, it, was, it wasn't obnoxious aesthetically but um, it was and, and there was nobody there I was there on the first day it was open to the public there must have been about 10 other people there I mean I was the only person eating lunch in the restaurant which is a very beautifully built especially built restaurant in this huge warehouse so that was a bit of a damp squib and um, I can't recommend 
the Lyon Biennale this year. It seems very under-promoted as well. There were hardly any posters around town for it. So then I headed back into Germany and to Stuttgart, where I have um, my good friend, the painter Abel Auer. He's about to leave Stuttgart, actually. He's sort of from there, but he's going back to Hamburg, where he was a student, to be a professor. He's making that, he, which is ironic, because he actually founded this thing called Academy Isotrope, which was a kind of fake uh, SATS academy art school, basically, because he wasn't able to get a place initially at the real art school. He made his own with a, a group of other... Um, painters at the time and uh, so now he's, he's it's a bit like the Salon de Refusé turning into the Salon itself you know the people who set up outside to do an alternative exhibition inevitably get sucked into the real exhibition finally they become academicians so this is his um, accession to that he's now what 40 I guess so it's time for him to uh, to get serious and um, so I did a little uh, performance, which was actually someone's birthday party, essentially. Um, it was in, in this kind of um, wagon, wagon, wagen I think it's called, which is uh, basically land owned by the railway company just outside Stuttgart. Stuttgart's a very, it's a very pretty little city, but it's also quite conservative and lumpen, you know, uh, lumpen bourgeois. So um, you have these little pockets, well, perhaps not many little pockets, but there is one little pocket of this kind of weird alternative utopian community uh, living out of converted container, freight containers. So um, this is where I performed, as I did last time in Stuttgart. Every time I play in Stuttgart, it's in this weird kind of railway hinterland with towers and kind of open fires out in the... the um, the areas between the sort of weird self-built houses. So that was fun and it went down really well and I was sort of <laughs> consulting my uh, iPhone for the lyrics I couldn't remember, which is what somebody, somebody did a little review of one of the Barcelona shows, um, said, uh, Momus is a, a strange senor, um, a peculiar man who consults his phone on stage and who because of his clothes looks like an outdated Bowie. Maybe that's why he named himself after the Greek god of jokes. But musically, this is gold, proposing an amalgam of influences with electronic elements and pop intentions. So um, I think most people at the Stuttgart show were just sort of showing up because they were regulars in that kind of crusty Stuttgart alternative world, and uh, they'd never heard of me. But uh, uh, some of them came up afterwards and said, wow, how have we never heard of you? Um, so it made some new fans. Um, it was free to get in as well. It was just a kind of impromptu thing. Just because Stuttgart is kind of in between Barcelona and Berlin, it's probably equidistant. So then I took those local trains back. And when I got back, I discovered copies of my new book, which is actually an old book of mine. It was digital only uh, initially on fiction. Now it's been published by this, um, this company called um, Edition Taberna Critica. Taverna is where you eat in Greece, you know, taverna, and critic, I don't know, it's a critical taverna where you can buffet, you can just uh, stuff your face with intellectual material. So this is my Herr F., my Faust story, and it's actually a physical book now, but it's in German. It is a Germanic tale anyway, so it has to be in German, but um, I'm quite pleased with how it looks. I did the little drawing on the front of um, the Matterhorn, and it joins this little stack. I'm just going to proudly show you the little stack of all my publications now. This I found in a, in a library in Barcelona, really close to my youth hostel. Fantastic modern library that was open late at night. Very few people in there, but just beautiful design. So they had El Libro de las Bromas, which is, and it was recommended by the library staff. They must have read it and, and had a bit of a hoot. Um, that's um, the Book of Jokes, of course. Um, oh, sorry, that's the Book of Scotland. <laughs> An America in French, An America in English, um, the Book of Japan's, Book of Scotland's, um, the French edition of the, the Book of Jokes, and the original Book of Jokes in um, American, I was going to say, in, in English. Um, so the next one to join these will be my, um, my memoir, uh, niche, which comes out in July 2020. And um, so it was nice to, to see that. It's always nice to see physical copies. I've got physical copies of Accordion very soon as well. And... Um, Yes, so over touristification, I'm 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 kind of part of it, but I'm trying to be, you know, I I was um, 
very touched by the Extinction Rebellion thing, and, and I'm trying to limit my CO2. This is the first year I haven't been to Japan in years, so I'm limiting my long-haul flights, limiting all my flights as much as possible, trying to take ground travel. Trains are the most ecologically um, efficient means of travel. I'm very much into travel. Travel sort of does things to my brain. I just love gazing out of train windows, usually with a with a book. This time I was reading André Gide's um, memoir, the first volume of his memoir, um, Si le Grand se meurt, I think it's called. If the, I, th I think it's from the, the, the parable of the reaper and the bad seed and stuff. Um, that title. But um, yeah, he's, I, for some reason I find André Gide a very sympathetic figure. Slightly pompous sometimes, but um, sort of intense in a good way. And um, I like I like his his emphasis his access, accent on his gayness and therefore on sex. Um, that's kind of important to me that a writer is interested in their sexuality. Um, I, for some reason, writers who are not interested in their own sexuality come across to me like stuffed shirts. Um, so it's good to be back in Berlin. I went to the um, my favorite thing to do in Berlin is the um, the Nalkorn Flohmarkt, which is a sort of bourgeois bohemian market that happens every couple of weeks quite close to my house here and uh, I always buy something what's that oh I bought this um, André Breton interviews in French I just started reading that and he's talking about um, the 1418 war and what that brought out in his fellow uh, his age group and his compatriots um, and the kind of surreal way that people were dealing with uh, the, the stresses of military life, um, giving birth to Dada and surrealism after the war. Um, so much has come out of wars. It's amazing. So much of what we think of as liberal culture is the product of military research. It's actually quite um, humbling or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, just as a footnote to the over-touristification thing I was talking about last time, Thomas Cook has just gone out of business, um, stranding a lot of tourists all around the world. I doubt that will really put a dent in the, um, the sort of desire of people to be tourists. It would be ironic if Brexit and that and various other factors like the CO2 Extinction Rebellion movement made people more reluctant to travel outside their own countries. It's this kind of weird new um, return to one's origins that and actually something I've been thinking about is because um, I have a little money uh, not enough to buy a flat in Paris but I have enough money to buy a flat in say Brussels where it's much more reasonable but you know like all British people I don't know what my citizenship status is going to be you could end up buying a, a house in a country that you um, you don't even have the right to live in or that it's a huge bureaucratic hassle to get nationality Etc. Etc. So um, <clears throat> at the moment, I'm I'm just happy to live in this light way, as if nothing. I can't own anything. I can't really be rooted anywhere. I'm gonna always mentally be prepared to to flit, to to do the only political thing which I've found effective, which is to get the hell out of a country when it turns sour. Somebody asked me the other day if uh, I was going to play a concert in. London again at the Café Otto? The answer is no, because England in particular makes me feel uncomfortable just now politically, deeply uncomfortable. It's so riven, it's so divisive, it's so putrid and hate-filled, it's toxic essentially. So I don't really want to go to a country like that at the moment. Um, I'm doing some events in Scotland in Stornoway the first couple of days of November, um, doing an unreliable tour guide thing uh, and also a kind of talking and singing event. So that's my only two events left this year. I'm also heading up to Hamburg uh, later this week to um, meet up with my ex-wife. That should be interesting. I haven't seen her in 10 years. So, um, and she's doing some conference thing in Hamburg, so that would be interesting. And um, that's, um, that's pretty much it. I don't have any projects now. This is a strange state of affairs. Usually I have a book to finish or a record to finish or at least some sleeves to do for these things. I, I actually posed for the official photograph that will go on the back of Niche the other, uh, yesterday. Um, that was the last thing, because we finished the editing now on the book. Essentially, I think we finished all the editing. Uh, now, we, haven't, we don't have a jacket design yet, but um, what we're doing is trying to get um, blurbs from influencers from famous writers and other figures in the arts. So, so far we have um, 
Grant Morrison um, being very positive, Christian Kracht being very kind. Who else has promised? Um, oh, Ariel Pink has promised. A, these people are all reading advanced copies of the book and loving it. I have to say they are all very positive. Of course, they're kind of allies anyway. Um, we should send it out to a few enemies or people who are slandered in the book. Actually, that's one thing the legal department is reading through the, the manuscript now to see that I'm not slandering anybody. I don't think I'm slandering anyone. Um, I'm not a slandering kind of guy, am I really? I'm pretty positive and friendly in my outlook. So uh, that's where we are. I don't have any projects. I should probably come up with a project to keep myself amused. And, you know, Satan makes work for idle hands to do. So we don't want that. We don't want old Nick and young Nick. Don't know which is which now. Maybe I'm old Nick now and Satan is young Nick. <laughs> we don't want to tempt him to give me um, alternative work. That's it. That's really, um, that's all I've been up to. Thank you for listening and um, see you next time. Open University.